Hi guys, I want to just check whether um, you'd rather I finish off the lecture on Alter's own historical materialism, or I move on to the lecture on Altusa and the theory of ideology. Uh, can I have, um, can people say out loud which they would prefer? Not getting any response from that. Uh, yeah, if anyone has a problem with the mic, I guess you can put it in the, the chat as well. Put it, put it in the chat message. All to his own ideology. Okay. From Sankar. If I don't get any other response, from anyone else, I'll go with that. Okay. Oops, get that back up. Okay then, um, I'm going to be talking about materialism and the category of the subject and do that in the context of a critique of Althusser's theory of ideology. Now, be looking at why Althusser is important, what his theory was, what the notion of interpolation is. I'll then criticize Althusser's theory in section three after having presented it. And I'll then look at the history of the concept of the subject um, and how it relates to production relations. So why is Althusser important and what is his theory? Well, he's a notorious murderer. He murdered his wife. He was at one time a communist philosopher and he was a or is a massive guru to generations of cultural studies authors. And his key paper on ideology, which Lenin and, and ideology, has been, according to Google Scholar, cited over 13,000 times, which is a remarkable high impact level. Politically, he was on the orthodox wing of the French Communist Party, and in the latter part of the 60s became the ideological leader of the Maoist wing of the French Communist Party. And if you look at the, the citation of the, or the use of the word Althusser and the use of the word Mao Zedong um, in French texts, you can see that they almost exactly parallel one another um, in the 60s and early 70s, that with the rise of Maoism in France, there the came a rise in the interest of Althusser, in interest in Althusser, and with the decline of Maoism, interest in Althusser faded. And it didn't disappear completely, but it, it became much less significant. On the other hand, if we look in, in the English texts, we see that interest in Mao dropped off, though not quite as much as it did in France. And interest in Althusser, on the other hand, went on growing and peaked right in the end of the um, 1990s rather than the 1970s. So why did he have very different impact in the English speaking world from the French speaking world? Was it the case that Marxist-Leninist politics, Maoist politics were establishing themselves in England? No, that clearly wasn't the case. Um, this occurred at the point that the Maoist movement in England had declined to insignificance and the Orthodox Communist movement was rapidly declining. 
in France, Althusser was the philosopher of a militant labor movement. For the English, he was the philosopher of literary theory. Um, he was the philosopher of a left that was based in the universities, uh, which was effectively isolating itself from the great political issues of the day. Although Althusser spoke about the importance of conjunctural analysis and analyzing concrete conjunctures, the British Maoists, the Althusserians, instead of analyzing the British economy, British foreign policy, British military policy, they concerned themselves with literature, film, and gender. And while Thatcher was talking about there's no alternative, meaning no alternative to the free market, the British Althusserians were concerned with applying what they called cultural materialism to the works of Shakespeare. So Althusser as known in the English speaking world is a very different impact from Althusser as known in France. But what was his theory? And there are reasons why his theory had particular appeal to the British academic left. The, the components of his theory were what he called the reproduction standpoint, the notion of the state machine, the notion of an ideological state machine, which was one of his innovations, and the role of the state machine in the constitution of the subject. Now, what does he mean by the reproduction standpoint? He says, it follows that in order to exist, every social formation must reproduce the conditions of its production at the same time as it produces, and in order to be able to, be, to produce. It must therefore reproduce, one, the productive forces, and two, the relations of production. So that's from Lenin philosophy. Sorry, sorry, um, the book Lenin and philosophy from ideo ideology and ideological state apparatuses within that. The ideological state machine, he meant the following things. Uh, the religious ISA, the educational ISA, the family ISA, legal ISA, the political ISA, trade unions, communications, and cultural ISA. He's fairly specific that when he talks about an ideological state machine, he means something concrete in the sense that Engels meant, that it's a, a body of special purpose buildings and special purpose personnel, um, personnel with specific roles. That's very clear with the religious and educational ISA, and the political ISA becomes less clear with some of the other ones. He says that the function, that the dominant ideological state apparatus in France at the time he was writing was the school system. And that the school system must train people in submission or domination, submission for the working class, domination for the property class. What he says is, besides those techniques and knowledge, and in learning them, children at school also learn the rules of good behavior, i.e. the attitude that should be observed by every agent in the division of labor, according to the job he is destined for. Rules of morality, civic and professional conscience, which actually means rules of respect for the socio-technical division of labor, and ultimately, the rules of the order established by class domination. They also learn to speak proper French, to handle the workers correctly, i.e. for future capitalists and their servants to order them about and properly, order them about properly and ideally to speak to them in the right way. So he's saying that there are two streams in the education system, one of which teaches a group of people to be subordinate and obey orders, another of teaches people to give orders. He, then the next point is his notion of interpolation. Althusser claimed that ideology interpolates individuals as subjects. Now, if you're a native English speaker, this is a very obscure phrase. What the hell does interpolate mean? 
doesn't have any prior English meaning. Um, it doesn't come into English except through the work, the translated works of Althusser. And it, it isn't an English word. It's a direct reprinting of the word in the French text. And there are several places where, in my view, the translations of Althusser by Brewster and Gosgarian use English phrases which are really um, obscure when there were clear ones to be had. I mentioned that when in the context of the term materialism aléatoire, whereas the, which is directly translated as aleatory materialism, whereas it should be stochastic materialism. Similarly, um, Brewster's translation of uh, Althusser uses the term givens for Donny, whereas he should be saying data. He's talking about scientific data. He's saying givens, which uh, confuses things. There is already a word for it in English. But let's look how the word interpellation is used in French. This is a news item from a couple of years ago, en direct. Chez les gens, plus de 220 interpellations à Paris, dont 163 gardés à vue. What does it, it mean? It means these were people stopped by the police, of whom two thirds were actually put in, in, in police custody, arrested for the night. Now let's see how Althusser uses the term. I shall then suggest that ideology acts or functions in such a way that it recruits subjects among the individuals or transforms the individuals into subjects by that very precise operation, which I've called interpolation and which can be imagined along the lines of the most commonplace everyday police interpolation. Hey, you there. Uh, where he imagines the policeman calling out to someone. Well, that's not actually what the usage in the context of the Les Gilets Jaunes was. This is a, a, an interpellation policier uh, a couple of years ago. It's the police seizing people. And the French police have rather more direct means than ideology to ensure this subjection. Althusser's argument, as soon as someone turns his head, when a gendarme calls out, et vous là-bas, they are implicitly subjecting themselves to police authority. Well, maybe so, but he, he, this I think is rather idealist. There are more direct ways of producing subjects. This is uh, how Queen Victoria produced subjects in, India after the mutiny, the, those who rebelled were tied to the front of canyon, cannons and the cannons fired to blow them to pieces. This is how Queen Elizabeth established sub, the, the Kenyans as her subjects, rounding those who disobeyed up at gunpoint and putting them in detention camps. It wasn't ideology, it was force that made people subjects of these, these monarchs. So my view is that Althusser grossly overstates the role of ideology. He overestimates its importance for capitalist production. He confuses the ideological role, the role of ideology in capitalism and in feudalism. He misrepresents the importance of schools by claiming schools are necessary for capitalism and misrepresents the true role of ideology. The important point is that capitalist relations of production are self-reproducing. They don't depend on ideology. They're reproduced via the law of value. They're not reproduced via belief in the law of value. 
workers don't have to believe in or be loyal to capitalism for capitalism to exist. Workers can in fact be convinced socialists, but they still have to sell their labor power and they're still exploited. French workers, industrial workers in Althusser's day largely voted for the Communist Party or the Socialist Party. That didn't weaken French capitalism because they had no choice but to sell their labor power. On the other hand, if you look at feudal society, it did depend on ideology at the point of production. That's because surplus extraction was avert, what is the economic historians call extra economic coercion. And this coercion required both the ideological sanction of the church and the fact that the aristocracy were armed, were on horseback and had armor, whereas the peasants didn't. On the other hand, capitalist exploitation doesn't depend either on ideology or on direct force. It arises from people acting freely in their self-interest. Marx puts it well here. In Capital, he says, the, the sphere that we are deserting while within the boundaries of the sale and purchase of labor power, with, sorry, within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on, is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. There alone rule freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. Freedom because both buyer and seller of a commodity, say labor power, are constrained only by their own free will. They contract as free agents and the agreement they come to is but the form in which they give legal expression to their common will. Equal because each enters into relation with the other as a simple owner of commodities and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. Property because each disposes of what only what is, is his own and Bentham because each looks only to himself. So this is directly contrary to Althusser. He's saying it is the, the direct operation of the relations of production, which gives rise to ideologies, run ideologies, enforce the relations of production. So let's look at this claim that schools are necessary to reproduce capitalist relations. At the time Marx was writing, British capitalism functioned without state schools. Children went to work as soon as they were old enough without any, any education. This didn't undermine capitalist relations of production. They worked perfectly well. And the same could be said of the Soviet Union. When privatization took place in the Soviet Union, even though you had an entire population that had been schooled in communist ideology, once the property relations were changed, once people were forced to sell their labor power to the oligarchs who now owned the, the businesses, they had no alternative and capitalist relations of production were established by the change in the ownership of the means of production. That wasn't because they were persuaded that it was right or necessary. It was because they had no alternative. So let's look at this interpellation idea. My view is that it's complete idealist speculation. It's based on a set of unsubstantiated claims, claims which were applied just as much to dogs as to human beings. And the claim that subjects and souls really exist, which he actually says, is just pure idealism. And it's attributing magical properties to words. Let's look at the un unsubstantiated claims. This is, is th this whole stuff on the, inter on the theory of interpolation comes down to a couple of pages. Um, and a couple of pages in which he tells parables. He says, there are individuals walking along somewhere, usually behind them. The hail runs out, hey you there. One individual, 
nine times out of 10, the right one, turns round, believing, suspecting, knowing that it is for him, i.e. recognizing it's really he that is meant by the interpolation. By this mere 180 degree physical conversion, he becomes a subject. Why? Because he has recognized that the hail was really addressed to him and it was really him who was interpolated and not someone else. Well, Althusser provides no evidence whatsoever to back up his claim 90% of times that this is the right person who turns the head. Is there any video footage of the arrests carried out of the Gilets Jaunes where this scene actually plays out? Do people stop when they're shouted at? No, they run away. They run away until they're caught. Um, and even if they do turn their head, even if someone does turn their head, how many people turn their head when there is a shout, hey, you there? Does only one person turn their head? Has he got any film to show that? You get a dog to do the same thing. If I shout the na name of my dog, she turns her head. But is she a subject? I got her to, to study Badia's book on the subject and she just wasn't interested. She went off to sniff hailings on that post instead. So let's look at this business of the, the category subject. Obviously the philosophers talk about it, but what is it? My contention, and this is the contention of past pre-Althusserian Marxist legal theory, is that subjects are a legal category. They're not something in people's heads. The philosophical subject is then just a reflection by the philosophers of the legal relations which underlie the production relations. And so long as philosophy is just reflecting law, which itself reflects the production relations, it is itself just ideology. And it's important to recognize that the legal category of the, of the subject is, is quite different in feudal and capitalist relations of production. And it is also quite different in the English and French languages. There's another instance of wrong translation here. Now, for what the legal category of the subject is from the standpoint of the Marxist theory of law, I advise you to read Pashukhanis on this. The important point about the category of subject in bourgeois sort law, and this is only continental law, okay? This is French and German law. Pashukhanis writing in Russian was reflecting on German philosophy of law and German terminology. Bourgeois law assigns a category of subject to non-human entities. Now, for instance, BMW in Germany is legally a Rechtssubjekt. In America, General Motors is what's called a legal person. The US Supreme Court holds that firms like General Motors because they're legal persons, have the right to free speech, which the US Constitution grants to persons. And as such, they're allowed to contribute to political campaigns. In other words, the US Supreme Court justifies the buying up of politicians. But there's two points to bring out here. One is that the abstract category of a subject is the abstract category of the buyer or seller of commodities. Now, insofar as a human being 
is a buyer or seller of commodities, they are a subject. But any legal entity, any owner of commodities, be it a firm or body corporate, is in law or in continental law, a rex subject. In English law, they're a legal person. Now there is a confusion, again a translation confusion, that the category subject comes across philosophically to the English speaking world as a mistranslation. It, the, the term subject in that sense first occurs according to Google Engram search in German in Fichte's work and then gets translated as legal subject into English. But the corresponding category in English and American law is legal person. So there is immediately a confusion here, which comes from a philosophical borrowing of a legal term in another language. Now let's look at the ahistoric character of how Althusser talks about the subject. He's claiming, firstly, that the category of the subject is created by interpolation. That interpolation is fundamentally what ideology is. That subjects and ideologies are eternal, they exist in all societies, and that subjects are the same as souls or gods. So we have a bourgeois legal category, the category of a property owner who can buy and sell commodities. And this is then projected as something which explains human behavior and as a reflection on the history of philosophy, Althus is saying, this is the same thing as the soul in pre-capitalist philosophy. Okay, by this I mean that even if it only un un appears under this name, the subject with the rise of bourgeois ideology, above all with the rise of legal ideology, which borrowed the legal category of juridical subject to make an ideological notion that man is by nature a subject, the category of the subject, which may function under other names as a soul in Plato, God, etc., is a constitutive category of all ideology, whatever its determination and whatever its historical date, since ideology has no history. Well, this is, to my mind, completely contrary to the standpoint that Marx takes in the German ideology, which is that ideology does have a history, that the history of ideology is shaped by the social relations which exist at a given time, and that the ideological concepts at a given time are a reflection of these social relations. And to me, this looks like an the very thing that Althusser otherwise criticizes, writing history in the future anterior, writing the notion of the, the soul in Plato as the same thing as the category subject in bourgeois ideology. He is confusing the role of ideology under feudalism and capitalism because it's not needed for surplus extraction under capitalism, but is needed for surplus extraction under feudalism. But he also confuses what is meant by the subject in feudal ideology with the concept of the subject in capitalist ideology. And it exists in both, the, the term exists in both ideological systems, but it means something different. In feudal society, the relation is that of a subject to a sovereign. The opposite of a subject is the sovereign 
to whom he is the subject. So Queen Victoria was making the Indians her subjects. If you look in both English and French texts from before the late 1700s, when the word subject is used, the word subject is qualified as subject so-and-so, so-and-so, subject of the King of France, subject of the Prince of Britain, oh, of, of um, sorry, can't, Brittany wasn't a province, um, the Prince of the Netherlands, etc. The relationship which exists in capitalist law is subject to subject, which are the, between different property owners or subject to object between a property owner and their property. This is quite different from the category in feudal law and feudal ideology. It's the same word, but it's not the same social relation. But when he talks about domination, he slides over from the actual usage of the concept in bourgeois law to talk about it in, in the feudal sense, to, to the feudal sense of domination by the state, which isn't the basis of capitalist uh, production relations. And when he's talking about the subject and interpolation, then he's no longer talking about the capitalist subject. He's no longer talking about bourgeois subjects of right. So let's look at the origins of this word. If we look at the great uh, the, uh, and an orthodox source of Marxism and Leninism, the great Soviet uh, encyclopedia defines subjectivism as a worldview which ignores the objective approach to reality and denies the objective laws of nature and society. Subjectivism is one of the main epistemological sources of idealism. In essence, it grants primary primacy to the role provide, played by the subject in various spheres of activity and in cognitive processes above all. Well, that's fine or relatively fine. But it goes on to say, subjectivism has been founded, expounded by such philosophers as Berkeley, Hume, Fichte, and the philosopher Kant is also marked by subjectivist concepts. In the bourgeois philosophy of the 19th and 20th centuries, subjectivism has been a basic principle of such idealist thought as neo-Kantianism, empiric criticism, the philosophy of life, pragmatism, neo-positivism, positivism and existentialism. Again, this is fair enough, and they are, in fact, more or less pressing Lenin's materialism and empiric criticism there. Various distortions of Marxism and Lenin's have their foundations in subjectivism. Right-wing revisionism, proceeding from a subjectivist understanding of practice, eclectically attempts to combine the principles of Marxist philosophy with subjectivist philosophical conceptions, such as existentialism and practice, pragmatism. Again, that's great. This is, again, more or less a, a, a summary of Lenin's position. But it then falls down to my mind. According to Marxist philosophy, which rejects subjectivism, the subject's active role in practical life and the cognitive processes presupposes the existence of a dialectical relationship between subject and object, as well as the existence of an objective reality that has its own laws and independence of consciousness. Now, to my mind, this is a reversion to the conceptual framework that Marx and Engels are criticizing in the German ideology. Remember, the book is a critique of the German ideology. This is posing things in within the internal language of what they called the German ideology. The, my objection to this point is that it's uncritically accepting the actual categories of German idealist philosophy. 
And this German idealist philosophy stemming from Fichte is just an, a reflection by nascent German bourgeois society of the categories of bourgeois law which were coming into existence at the start, at the end of the 18th, early 19th century and displacing feudal social relations. So I'm saying that the, uh, the official Soviet philosophy and Althusser was a very orthodox communist is a partial retreat from what Marx and Engels called a repeat retreat to what Marx and Engels called the German ideology, the philosophical system of the German bourgeoisie in the early 19th century. And this involved taking the legal superstructure and suggesting the categories of bourgeois law were fundamental categories of existence. Early 19th century bourgeois law assumes legal subjects and legal objects. The philosophers abstract these legal supports of bourgeois individualism as unquestioned premises of the philosophical system. In their criticism of the German ideology, Marx and Engels never stoop to using its categories. If you go right through the, German, the book, The German Ideology, they nowhere mention subject and object, much less their dialectical interaction. They start off by saying, since we're dealing with Germans who are devoid of premises, we must begin by stating the first premise of all human existence, therefore of all history, the premise namely that men must be in a position to live in order to make history. But life involves before anything else, eating and drinking, a habitation, clothing and many other things. The first historical act is thus the production of the means to subject, satisfy these things, the production of material life itself. So the, the critique of the German ideology by Marx and Engels doesn't use the category subject and object at all. It talks about real life. It talks about the fact that we must eat, that we must, must work to eat. That is the, 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 the starting point, not these abstractions of bourgeois law. So first, there must be the production of human life, therefore sexual reproduction. There must be a production of food and clothing and housing. That implies there must be production relations, a division of labor and commodity exchange. Not necessarily a commodity exchange, but at the time he's writing a commodity exchange. You then get an ideological reflection of these, including law. So you get the legal subject established on the basis of their already having come into existence, commodity relations in which agents exchange commodities. The object is therefore just private property. And the Philosophy is just reflecting these legal relations and inventing the category philosophical subject as an unquestioned premise, because it's the unquestioned premise of the social relations in which the philosophers lived. But these are historical. Production relations change. And when that happens, you get a change in the legal superstructure. And when that happens, that changes the unquestioned pr premises of philosophers. So the subject is not something eternal. It's a product of history. It's a product of a specific historical period, the period of nascent bourgeois society. Um, I, I made extensive use in checking this out or using Google Ngram search. Google have digitized about a quarter of all the books ever printed. And it's easy to get precise indications of how often and how words were used in any written language that they have digitized since the invention of the printing press. And if you use this, you can see that the modern category subject is a specific product of bourgeois society, 
and only occurs in texts following the final overthrow of feudal relations of production. Let's take um, the origin of the world, where the definition of it is Middle English in the sense person owing obedience from the old French sujet, from Latin subjectus brought under, participic, participle subiere, subicere, from sub under, yacere to throw. Here's the first occurrence of the word subject in English, in recorded in Google Books, i.e. thus first occurrence in a printed book. John Siquian Squeen, alias Shoes, born a subject to the Duke of Cleves, six shillings and eightpence. This is from the calendar of patent rolls preserved in the public record office in England, that's a record of payment to the state by a subject to the Duke of Cleves. It, similarly, if you look in French, the first usage of it slightly earlier, the Capitaine Salvador d'Aguirre, Capitaine pour l'édit Marquis Françoise de la Place Forte et Château de, Vez de Vrezeur, lui remonstrant qui est en né sujet de roi et mis à la garde d'Isselle Place par l'édit Marquis Françoise est en sujet et serviteur. Similarly, it's encoding uh, a relation of personal servitude and dependence. So that is what it, the term means when it's mentioned in official documents of that time. In feudal ideology, a subject is always a, uh, a subject of a sovereign. The polarity isn't between subject and object, it's between the subject and his or her, so sovereign, between the sovereign and his or her subjects. And that's because feudal social relations are based on individual personal subordination. A person is conceived both biologically, i.e. he was born subject of the king, and metaphorically in terms of relations of subordination and domination. You're born in a particular position in the society. And you're conceived of as having this subjected position. Now, Althusser, in his treatment of ideology, constantly slips into this feudal notion. Let's take the usage of the word in the 1700s and, and getting a dictionary of French and English of the time. What does it say to the word, what, how does it define the word subject? Defines it as tied, obliged to any dependence, one that is under the domination of a sovereign prince. So this is, even in the earliest stages of capitalist relations of production, when the states were still monarchies, that is how it's defined. In French usage, it's equivalent to the people of the state. And the, 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 this dictionary gives two translations. It is impossible to raise great taxes without grieving the subject. They translate that into, il est impossible de lever les, des gros impôts sans fouler le peuple. In the English, usage, the subject already means all the people subject to the king. And that is made explicit when they translate it into the French usage. So at this point in French, there is a slide from specific subjection by the state to just translating the term as equivalent to all the people since all people other than the king were subjects. The 19th, 19th century French and English also continue to use the word in the sense of subject of the king, subject matter, and subject of a sentence. Now, subject matter and subject of a sentence are actually words of a different 
Latin origin. But uh, in that meaning, it has a different origin. In German, it starts to be used in a specifically bourgeois sense from the early 19th century. Um, sorry, I was wrong in saying that uh, it was Fichte, it was Thomas's textbook on nat natural law that is the first use of it, 1803. So the modern English usage is a legal person. French uses is sujet juridique. The German is Rechtssubject. And if you see English translations of German texts, they use the term legal subject or subject of right. And uh, sorry, the first usage in this sense in English is the English translation of Fichte. All these refer to the same thing the abstract property owner, abstract buyer and seller of commodities. Commodity production makes all concrete labors appear in the abstract form of exchange value. And simultaneously, commodity producing society gives all buyers and sellers of commodities the abstract form of legal persons or subjects of right. Companies are legal subjects, collections of people can be legal subjects, but not all persons are legal subjects. This was clear by the mid 19th century. Take an American legal textbook, a human being or aggregate body of human beings in this exact and limited sense of the expression is a legal person, a term which like other legal terms on some sides cover more than is covered by the popular world. Not all human beings are legal persons. Under a condition of absolute slavery, the unhappy human beings who are slaves are not persons in the legal sense. This is a US textbook written just after the abolition of slavery. So the Ford Motor Company is a legal person. An individual capitalist is likely, is likewise. They are in Marx's terms, personifications of capital. The slave who couldn't buy and sell, but was bought and sold, couldn't be a subject of right. They were an object of property. Okay, summarize the critique of Althusser's theory. Legal categories are, product, are reflections of production relations. Generalized commodity production creates the abstract legal person. Such legal persons are formally equal in law. They can enter into contracts, though in practice, obviously, there, are, there is some inequality in this equal right, because it, it's an equal right, an equal right, which allows for different amounts of property to be held. This is then mystified by bourgeois philosophy. It takes the elementary legal form under which capitalist, the capitalist is personified turns it into a rarefied abstraction, apparently divorced from the real economic relations which create it. But if you take this seriously, it implies that subjects have a purely formal legal relations. They have no causal effect. They're not something material. They are a way in which bourgeois law categorizes things which exists. And you can't give any material explanation of human behavior if your explanation depends on there being a subject inside people's heads. There isn't a subject inside people's heads. The term subject refers to a legal relation between owners of property. They, these categories only exist at the level of property relations and their projections into the working of the human brain is entirely ideological and unscientific. It is the eternalization of capitalist production relations. Brains are biological systems. They're not governed by bourgeois legal categories. They have their own natural laws which govern their operation. So what I'm saying is 
whilst there is some strength to what Althusser says about the existence of ideological state apparatuses, he adopts a set of pre-Marxist propositions in his theory of ideology. He claims that the subject is an internal category of ideology, whereas it's a category which metamorphoses with the transition of production, transition between modes of production. And insofar as he ties the category to any social relations, he presents the subject in its pre-bourgeois form of domination by the monarch or domination by the state. Now, the, the sovereign, of course, is just the legal personification of the state. So what he's doing there is just a transposition of the feudal subject so sovereign dialectic onto the modern world. And then he projects that into human skulls as a psychological entity put there by language and ritual. His psychological account means that he fails to mention the dominant role that actually non-human subjects play in capitalist society. Our society is dominated by the operation of those great subjects like Google, General Motors, Tesco, the big firms. These are the subjects which are the dominant subjects of bourgeois society or the most important subjects of bourgeois society. And the, the category subject as an explanation of how nervous systems works tells you nothing. Okay, what's the time? I'm, I'm five minutes, 10 minutes short of my allowance, but I'll stop here because that's the last slide, I think. No, there's, there's reading. Althusser, I'm taking it from Ideology and Ideological State Apparatus in the book, Lenin Philosophy. I was quoting Capital Volume One, and I can really strongly recommend E.B. Pashukhanis, Law and Marxism, A General Theory, which was available in English publications from the, the end of the, the 80s. The, there was a printing earlier than that. Okay, uh, let me stop, see if I can see, stop sharing. Uh, oh, how am I doing with this? Sorry, I'm just trying to see how, how to stop the screen share. Uh, uh, hmm. Ah, oh, that's it. Okay. Yep. Any questions? Oh. So, Sankar, can you explain what you're thinking there? If you unmute your speaker. Hello, is it audible? That's unmuted, yeah. Uh, I am talking about the uh, past 30 years economic reforms in India. Yeah, due to these reforms, uh, they have a, a great migration from countryside to the urban. And due to this, there is uh, inequality is uh, much more because uh, those who have been like uh, relatives or uh, in the same community, those who migrated into the urban area have become somewhat uh, uh, in more much more material wealth uh, rather than who stayed in the countryside. So maybe these inequalities uh, may tend to 
change the ideology so because uh, earlier uh, the system was based on the traditions like uh, not on market market relations and now it has been completely marketized yeah that is my comment okay yes i get what you're saying uh, this affects in ideology yes i i can see, see you're saying that the, the this change to neoliberal economic policies has in itself added to the rise of um, religious ideology as a support for political parties. Is that what you're saying? Uh, due to the recent developments against uh, religious minorities in the country also. So you have to scape, scapegoat some other community in order to uh, create distractions see yes you, you you cannot address the inequality so you you will distract by saying that uh, they are uh, minor minority due to them only we are not getting jobs uh, there is competition so that is the ideology i am referring to Anyone else want to raise any points on this? I'm sorry, I know I'm not part of the class. Can I just ask something quickly? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering when you were talking about, um, uh, did you let John, the, that's not how they react um, by hearing the call and so on. Um, but I thought he also distinguished between, um, what does it call them? RSAs, right? Restrictive uh, state apparatuses, right? Repressive state apparatus. Repressive, not restrictive. Yes, that's right, repressive. Um, so is there, and it's been a long time since I've read those texts, but are sort of both going on or is it a, like, well, he's over, I think he overestimates the extent to which the French police actually do it by just calling people yeah. rather than rushing over and beating them over the head. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly if you watch the videos, that's that's what you see. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. But more generally, my point is that uh, Althusserian theory overestimates the importance of ideology. And yeah. that is something which is very satisfying to academics because they can make it makes their own work seem more important yeah 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 i got you thanks okay well i'm not getting any more questions so uh i'm going to um ring off in a moment and say goodbye to you and, and thank you for attending my, my lectures during this course. Yeah, uh, thanks obviously from everyone at SMR and everything and okay. we'll be in touch soon with- I'm, I'm uh, hoping that this yeah. material will be used in conjunction with stuff that Katerina is writing in, in a book that we're due to publish, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye for now.